Welcome to the Mangrove Community, strengthening the community one branch at a time. For more information about the community or how to volunteer, please visit mangrovecommunity.org. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Mangrove Community Presents Reasonable Doubt Podcast. Uh, so... Let me just start off by saying, unfortunately, our um, guests, they had some unforeseen circumstances and they couldn't make the show today. Uh, but as we know, the show must go on. <laughs> so we're here. And um, we're going to continue this conversation about voting. And actually, as we continue this conversation, I would like, I really want to hear from you all. I know um, experience with past shows, you know, we have the our guest on and it's more like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I really would love to hear from you. Um, yeah, but before we get started, um, again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate the support. We appreciate the love. Y'all could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us right now at this moment, and we appreciate that. Um, We've been going for a minute now, and if you're just tuning in, uh, we would definitely love for you to hit the like button so you can follow us and stay tuned, uh, stay up to date with what we have going on. Mangrove community is, is strictly that we're about the community, and we always have things going on, resources available. Um, so we, we would love for you to subscribe and, and stay tuned and follow us. Uh, and another way you can support, hey, donations. We would love um, for your donations. You can go on to www.mangrovecommunity.org. Um, you can make a donation and you can pick up one of the I Vote shirts um, in return for your donation. So we can keep this thing going, y'all. Um, it's very important. This is an election year. And I've heard several people say, that um, this may be the most important election year. So Mangrove has put together some things to get people involved in this process who usually are not involved in this voting process. Um, I know it's a lot of people out there who believe that voting isn't important. So this is why we do what we do. And this is why we ask for your continued support so we can continue to spread the message, continue to educate people within our community to let them know that your vote does count and your voice will be heard. Um, but we have to do this as a collective, you all. So again, uh, www.mangrovecommunity.org um, and you can hit the donate button. You can also purchase a shirt. You can donate that way. Um, if you want to, if you like the podcast, um, this isn't the only place you can find us. Like right now, if you go over to the uh, Mangrove website, again, www.mangrovecommunity.org. If you go over to that website, we're streaming live from our website. Um, always press record. Is the production team behind this. Shout out to Trader Producer. Thank you for all that you do to keep us looking great. Um, you can go to www.alwayspressrecord.com. Um, we're live streaming there. And then, believe it or not, we're even on Roku. Um, you can download the APR app if you have Roku, and you can check us out on Roku. Um, just keep that, keep that in mind for future shows. Um, that's where we're at. So <clears throat> let's talk about voting. Uh, I know a lot of us, like I said before, we feel like, our vote doesn't count. We feel like voting, it doesn't matter in our sense. Where people want to know, where can I see my vote count? And at one point in time, I was one of those people. You know, I I voted. My first time voting was when Obama ran. And I can honestly say that the only reason. The only reason I voted for Obama was because of the color of his skin. And I don't have an issue with saying that, but that's that's what it is and that's what it was. And 
then Harvey hit. When Harvey hit, jumped into a lot of community work and looking for resources to take to those who were in need, who were heavily affected by Harvey. Um, we kept getting pointed in the direction of our elected officials and in reaching out to them and trying to connect with them and let them know where the need was. We just kept hitting brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. And I decided at that time, that even kind of threw me off when it came to voting. And maybe two years ago, I was one of those people who said, hey, I don't think this voting stuff works. So, I, hey, I'm not voting. But a light bulb went off. And that's when I had to remind myself of my one time of voting and the reason why I voted. So I decided to challenge myself um, and really get in. It happened to be election year that year, um, following Harvey. So I got in and I got to know the candidates that were running that had never been in office. Um, tried to get to know the candidates that were already in office. Um, that was tough. Um, I don't think we got anybody that was actually in office on the show at that time. So it was, again, that brick wall and that lack of communication that lack of being in the communities at the time of need and really knowing what the need is and providing for that need. I thought that's what the elected officials were all about. So I, will, I was turned off by that, but I was also intrigued to figure out if a person like myself, an ordinary cat from Greens Point, if I got involved, if I found out who the person was and I saw a candidate that I really felt like was sincere about what they were saying, what would that look like? if I jumped behind them and supported them and got other people to support them. So we decided to do that in the form of this podcast, Mangrove Community Presents Reasonable Doubt. We had several guests on here. Um, some of those guests, they actually made it into office. And we need more people in office, like the Letitia Plumbers of the world. Um, we've had Judge Jordan on here. We've had Judge Jones on here. Um, and these are people who are really, really doing the work. And I'm not counting anybody else out if you're out there doing the work and you're an elected official. But these are people that um, I, I saw their work. I saw how they work both in the community and in their elected position. And if we get the right people in office, we really can enact change in, in our communities. Uh, Give you an example. We ran into Letitia Plummer on the campaign trail last year. Yeah, it was 2019. In um, speaking with her, she seemed like she was very sincere about what she said she wanted to do when she got into office. Um, she was also one of those people, and this is what I did to test candidates before they ever even got into office. I want to see you work in the community in the space that you work in without this position. So we reached out um, to Ms. Plummer, who also owns a dental office. And at that time, we were doing a back to school drive. She donated 200 dental screens to that drive, which was amazing. Um, now she's in office. Um, she was very big on community gardens. She was very big on police reform um, on her campaign trail. She was very big on economic development um, within underprivileged or underserved communities. And now we fast forward, she's in office, been in office some months now. Um, she's attached herself to the Seed the Need, which they're attaching themselves to community gardens and helping them grow and implementing community gardens in communities that suffer from food desert. So in times of need, you'll have the resources within your own community. And this is what, that's what this is all about. That's what voting is about. It's about putting people in a place that's going to help you build your community. Um, and that's what we do this for. So in doing that, I want to let you all know about some things we have coming up. We have Power the Vote. That's the movement we're coming up. We've partnered with um, several organizations and entities. Um, for instance, Boost. We've partnered with Boost. They donated phones for us. Um, we're looking to get people registered to vote um, via phone banking, text banking. 
So if you're a person that's interested in getting involved with getting people registered to vote, with educating people also, um, you know, encouraging them to get to the polls and actually vote, then we would love your help with the uh, phone banking, the text banking. Uh, we're partnered with Pure Justice on that. So shout out to Pure Justice as well for their efforts in this whole thing. We're getting people registered to vote and um, encouraging people to actually get to the polls to vote. Because believe it or not, whether you know it or not, the millennial age group in Houston and Harris County, they're the most registered group, but they come in last place when it actually comes to getting to the polls and voting. So. We need to take that next step. If you fall in in that millennial age group, we need to take that next step. Uh, yeah, because your voter registration most times gets renewed when you renew your license. So it's really not much effort going into that. Um, so let's get to the polls and actually vote. And let's see who we're voting for. We have several positions on a local level. We have several judge positions that are open and people are running for those positions. And I know coming from where I come from, people have to go before the judge, you know, more than I would like to see. But to know that there's a judge sitting on that bench who has an understanding, a real understanding of people, and they understand that this may be your first mistake, this may be the only mistake that you ever made in life, they're not going to throw you away because of it. They'll try some type of restorative justice with you, um, putting you through certain programs and things like that to get you back out. And when it comes to bail, that's another thing that holds people up, that whole system period. When you get caught up in that system, if they hold you for too long, you risk losing your job. Now, not only have you been in jail, but you come out to losing your job. No job, you can't pay your bill. So hopefully you don't lose your apartment or your home or your car if you get behind on bills. So it's important that we have people on the bench deciding our fate in a way, in a humane way. Um, and they actually know the struggle. They know where these people come from. Not making excuses for them, but understanding that I caught you in a bad spot. Um, looking at your background. Mitigation is, is very big when it comes to sentencing. Does this person have a job? Are they a criminal? Are they a repetitive criminal? You know, Do they have a history of this? Or is this the first time thing? This is things that judges look at or should look at when determining sentencing a person. And I can give you another example. I was at a barbecue one time and I was talking to, to a guy and he happened to mention Judge Deshaun Jones. And he was telling me his story. You know, he, he had done some time. He did about 10 years, but it had been 22 years since he last got into any type of trouble. And he found himself in trouble. He got caught with a handgun. Uh, and he'd only carried around for protection just to make sure he stayed safe when out and about. We know how these Houston streets can be. Um, but he got caught with a gun. He was actually about to sign for six years. But his lawyer um, said, I think we should reset. And in resetting, there was a change of guard in that particular courtroom. Um, Judge Deshaun Jones took the bench. He was elected and took the bench. And they went to the court date once um, Judge Jones was on the bench. And Judge Jones took one look at the plea bargain, the plea agreement, and was like, uh, I don't I, I don't see where I can lock this man up for six years. And that he hadn't he hasn't gotten in any trouble in 22 years. And we're gonna lock this guy up. His family's there, they're here to support him, they're crying, they don't want to see him go. So he didn't agree with the six years. And fortunately enough, that guy didn't get six years. He got deferred judification. He was able to serve his time at home with his family. And he still hasn't gotten in any more trouble. So again, those are people that we need in office representing us. Um, 
what we got coming up, we're getting people registered to vote. The power of the vote, um, boost the vote, I vote. Outside of the phone banking, we'll be hosting voter registration events. Um, this coming up weekend, we'll be in the Fifth Ward area as, as well as the um, Lakewood area. So we'll be at Lakewood Park from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. You can come out. You can get registered to vote. We'll also have a food distribution so you can pick up some food as well. Um, we'll love to see y'all out. We'll have some special guests out there speaking. Um, you also can catch us live with our virtual tool, with our virtual concerts. We'll have artists that are supporting the movement. And uh, we want to keep you entertained during this whole thing. And we also, we're looking to get people involved in this voting process that have, that have never been involved that again, they don't think that their vote counts. So we want to let you know that it does count, um, getting involved. So this is how politics work. So let's say you have a candidate that represents your area, but no one in that area votes. What reason does that candidate have to even come over there and ask you what your concerns are, what your issues are, what, what things can be fixed within the community? They're not because it's going to fall on deaf ears. It's going to be wasted energy because at the end of the day, you're not going to go to the polls to vote to get that person in so they can do the things that they said they're going to do. So they don't have any, any reason to come. But now let's say, let's say Greenspoint, for, for instance. Let's say Greenspoint only has about 2,000 people that vote, if that. But we get enough people registered to vote. Let's say we get 10,000, 20,000 people registered and we let them know that the community of Greens Point, we're voting together. So we want to know what your, what your campaign is, what your platform is, what do you stand on? What do you see we need in our community? What can you do for our community? What can we help you do in our community? And these people will come and they will listen. And if they get into office at that point, so you get registered, you go vote for the person that you feel represents you and really will bring change to your community or support to your community, or whatever it is you may see or need in your community. Now, let me tell you another thing. Politics is not personal when don't get me wrong, if you have a personal problem, you maybe can bring it to them. They may be able to address it, they may not. But an elected official is more inclined to address an issue that is widespread, that affects more than one person in the community. So that's why communities need to come together, civic clubs, have meetings, talk to one another, find out what the common issues are, are there street light issues? Is it crime? Is it potholes? Is it them not picking up trash? Is it find out the common issue? And in doing that, then you bring that to your elected official and you let them know that, hey, not only am I having this issue, but A, B, and C, they're also having this issue. And we want to see how you can help us address this issue. They're more inclined to, to jump on things like that, especially when they know the entire community or multiple people from the community are affected by a particular problem. That's why that's one thing that we don't do within our communities right now. We're not together on the same page when it comes to voting the process. Who's running? What they what they're about? Um, for the life of me, I don't understand how Mayor Turner got back into office this year. And I've seen enough, so uh, I can say that we failed ourselves, we failed our community. Um, we're putting this guy back into office. I don't know if you all are aware or, or keep up with what's going on in the news, but lately here, they finally released body cam footage for the Nicholas Chavez murder. Now, uh, this happened back in April, April of 2020. April or May of 2020 is when this happened, this incident happened. 
Now, an organization I'm part of, a collective, um, Community Action Collective, which was formed back in May, we knew about this particular case since May. The family, had, their family was pleading for body cam footage to be released. The body cam footage wasn't released. Um, the organization we worked with, we were putting pressure on them to release the body cam. Now, this is why it's good to um, attend public session every once in a while. It's held every Tuesday down at City Hall. And because of COVID and everything that's going on right now, they're doing everything virtually. So there was a day on June 25th, over two to 300 people came down to City Hall to speak about police reform, about wanting to see subpoena power where you can actually ask for the body cam footage and they have a certain amount of time to release that footage. So the public and the family can see for themselves what happened in a particular case. And everybody knows the court of public opinion makes things move. So this footage was finally released this past week. The family called the police because their loved one was he was having a mental breakdown. The guy was harming, he was threatening to do harm to himself. So the family called the police to see if they could come assist. And when the police showed up, the guy started, he was stabbing himself. Police, they shot the guy 21 times. A guy who was obviously having a mental breakdown. And we heard the comments from the mayor, from the police chief. Prior to this footage being released, they would swear on their life that their officers were doing everything by the book, that their officers. They don't open up. They didn't want to hear it. They almost laughed at it. Now we're talking about the mayor and the chief. I'm not talking about the four guys that got fired. We're talking about the guys who had the power. And also keep in mind that the entire time the family's asking for the footage, the, the community organizations and leaders are asking for the footage, they had the footage in their possession. Now, whether or not they viewed it, I can't say. But if you did view it and your remarks were what they were, same on you. That makes it even worse because you knew what happened, but you wanted to save face. Again, this is our mayor and our police chief. I'll give you another example of what I like to call the ne neglected officials that we have in office the ones that neglect their communities, especially the ones who claim that they're from these communities and neglect the people in these communities. I'll give you another example. So in the, in the Acres Home community, where our mayor is from, you have in the 1960s and 1970s, the Booker Landfill, which was at West Donovan and Tidwell. This was a landfill at that time. If you go there now, it was about 30 acres of land. If you go there now, there's apartments, daycares, businesses. It's, it's been completely developed upon. It. So another thing that's present at those same homes, businesses, apartments, it's mold but you can visibly see from the outside. You see it growing on the outside of these buildings. You see it in the windows of these buildings. I don't go inside because it gets worse. If you look in the HVAC system, the HVAC systems are mold infested, right? To the point where you have people dying, literally dying from lung disease, from cancer. Um, you have people who or were not on dialysis before they moved into these 
communities, these homes, these areas, they're now on dialysis. You have a whole block where everyone, at least one person in every house died from cancer. And the reason being, this all was built on a contaminated landfill. So those contaminants seep up through the ground and they cause mold to develop on the outside of the home and the HVAC system. And these people are unaware that this mold can have the effect on it that it has. Back in 2003, the EPA, they did testing on the soil and found the soil to be contaminated because the community requested that it be tested. So the EPA came out and they tested the soil and they found it to be contaminated. This is back in 2003. Right now today, if you drive over there, they're building $300,000 homes on this property. Now, these are the things that we don't know about. Just like while our police chief is on the news parading around, like Houston is the best city when it comes to policing, he's not telling you that there has been a police involved killings in the city of Houston since April. They don't want to talk about that. But these are the people that we put in office to represent us. And then do we need to talk about the cancer clusters that last election year, last year, you had all the candidates who were running for office. And these are the ones who were already in office. So this to solidify their seat to make sure they stay in there. They were holding press conferences about the cancer clusters in Fifth Ward. Ask me, has anything been done about the cancer clusters in Fifth Ward? Not at all. So it's time to get these neglected officials out of office. There are people that are running right now to represent you on the state level, on the local level, that really do want to see change within these communities. Let's connect to these people and let's make sure that they get into office. Um, you have people who under who are under the impression and the understanding, which is partly true. It's, there's some truth to it that the policy that elected officials only support people who donate to their campaigns. So we don't want those type of officials in office. We don't want officials that that move because of money. We want officials who are already doing the work. Again, like I said, check them out. What are you doing in your community now? You want my vote. What are you doing in the community now to help the community? If you're not doing nothing, then you can't get my vote. The office is supposed to elevate what you're already doing, not put you in a position to do something you want to do. Because you might lose focus if you're not focused coming in already. Um, so this is what's going on. And this is why it's important that we vote. This is why it's important that not only that we vote, but we're informed and educated about who we're voting for and what they're representing or not representing what they're neglecting or not neglecting, what the issues that they choose to take on or not take on. Are, are they only showing up for the picture and then they leave? Or are they actually putting in the work? So I'm encouraging everybody to get out. I'm not even encouraging. Get out, get registered to vote, and then get informed. We'll continue to interview candidates as they come on this show. We'll continue to speak with them. And at that time, you can make a decision on if that person is right for you, or they really represent your community the way you would like to be represented. Um, if that is the case, then jump on board and vote for them. But now look, I'm gonna tell you the other part. Once you vote for a candidate, once they get in office, the work is still on you to hold that person accountable. Did they do what they said they were gonna do? Did they start it? Did they do anything? If not, next time it comes to vote, vote them out. Vote the next person in. Because the thing is, and we take this back to the Bible where he said, don't forsake the assembly. And I think people only put that in the context of going to church. But coming together, the assembly, 
is what get things done. It's what get the job done. That's where accomplishments happen. When you have people come together on one accord to push for the same thing. Because we can't fix everything overnight. And that's the part that that's the most frustrating, but it's realistic at the same time because if it's only one person or or you talk about money, there's only so much in the budget, then there's only so much that you can do at one time. If you're working on the car, you can't change the tire and the oil at the exact same time. You can multitask and while the oil draining, maybe start doing the tire and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's a process. And we have to follow the process. And the first step in the process is getting registered so you can vote. The second part is getting informed and educated about the people that are looking to represent you. And then going to the polls and actually voting. And lastly, holding them accountable and continue to hold them accountable. But not only that, we live in these communities. Why aren't we raising up our young ones? Why aren't we introducing them to this world to let them know that, hey, you can actually lead this community here. You don't have to go off and be president or anything like that. You can live in your community and be a representative of your community. And it's a lot at stake. We have a governor right now for Texas who wants to freeze um, tax money that cities and jurisdictions would receive if they support defunding the police. Now, when we talk about defunding the police, we're not talking about getting rid of the police force altogether. What we're talking about is reallocating funds so that when police officers come across a situation like Nicholas Chavez, which is somebody who was obviously mentally um, disturbed at the time, that maybe you can have a third party um, who's inclined to deal with these type of manners. Maybe they can come out and assist. Or maybe they're called as an alternative to the police. Because this isn't the first time I saw this happen. Uh, it actually happened right in my community, in the Greenspoint community with Danny Ray Thomas. Danny Ray Thomas was another man who was having a mental breakdown that day. And the police were called. And it was right on the, in, right, the intersection of Imperial Valley and Greens Road. Police were called. The guy had his hands up. They came out, the police came out, guns drawn. He put his hands up, actually pulled his pants down to show them that he didn't have anything. This guy was fully exposed and they shot and killed him. So we need officials in office that are pushing for police police reform in some sort, because it's not right what's going on right now. In this Nicholas Chavez case, she just shed a lot of light on what's really going on in the city of Houston. And again, it's a culture. It, it's a culture and it is based around race, unfortunately. Um, but we're looking to change that culture. And unfortunately, if you're a part of that culture, then you may not have these experiences with HPD or with sheriffs or with constables. But if you find yourself outside of that culture, then you have these type of experiences. So I do understand where people come from when they say, oh, I, I love the police. I think they, they don't do anything wrong. I understand where you're coming from because you're not on the other side of it. So they're not gonna treat you like that. But we need, we need to bring humanity back into these positions. So again, we'll be at Lakewood Park from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturday, September 19th. Um, we'll have food distribution. We'll have some giveaways and things like that for you. So we would love for you all to come out, get registered, um, get informed, and go vote. Um, the second part of the day, and that's how important this is, we're doing tour days. So for y'all who play football, <laughs> remember them tour days? This is where we at. So 
we're doing two a day. So the second part of the event will be um, in Fifth Ward. So we'll be in the Fifth Ward area. We'll be getting people registered to vote over there. So you, if you're in the Fifth Ward area, we'll be in Fifth Ward from two to six. Um, stay posted for the flyers and things like that. We kind of had a um, venue correction. So um, that'll be coming soon as far as the Fifth Ward site. But we're in Lakewood for sure um, at Lakewood Park. Um, stay tuned for updates on the Fifth Ward location. Um, and that should come out probably tomorrow. So we'll be there. So if you're in any one of those areas or close to those areas and you want to come out and support, hey, come out and support. We would love to see you out. We would love to get you registered. We would love to give you some information on the candidates, on the voting process, um, voter suppression. Voter suppression, voter suppression, and voter suppression. So for you who think that your vote doesn't count, this is the question I ask. If your vote doesn't count, why has it been since? Well, okay, of course, slavery, you had certain groups that couldn't vote. Then post slavery, you had maybe a 10 year period where you had um, people of color or blacks or African Americans, Americans <laughs> that took office, right? And they held high position, governors, lieutenant governors. They were even in the um, federal, in the Senate, U.S. Senate, state Senate. They were even mayors and councilmen on the local level. And this was for about a 10-year period, the Reconstruction period after slavery. And in my research, I see why the South was completely torn apart. They were trying to pull themselves back together. They didn't have time to worry about who was voting, who they were voting for, who was in office, who wasn't in office. They were trying to rebuild themselves. But after about 10, and really the black codes and all of that were implemented instantly in a lot of states. 1865 and 1866, you had the black codes come about. But I don't think they were enforced because you still had people that were in these offices in these seats and held high ranking offices after slavery. But that happened from about 65, 66 to about 1877. And that was when, that was about, 1877 is when the Union pulled out their last troops out of the Confederate South. And you see what happened. Almost instantly, you had the KKK come through and start raising hell. And a lot of these people lost their seats. And you had the Jim Crow laws that came about. You had, you had to take a literacy test. You had to pay a voting tax. There were all type of things put in place to prevent people like you and I from voting. So if your vote doesn't count, why for a hundred years, after slavery, were there tactics, even laws, statutes that were put into place that prevented people like you and I from voting, if your vote doesn't count? Because I know what happens if your ID expires, your driver license expires, and you get caught driving with it, you're in trouble. Nobody's in trouble for not being registered to vote but you had all type of laws that were in place for a hundred years to prevent you from voting. And now, that was a hundred years. <laughs> the system and the structure was set. Then you had the civil rights movement where we had major breakthroughs. And that was people who came together on one accord and decided, you're going to give us our right to vote. They were no longer asking. They were no longer trying to compromise. They said, you're going to allow us to vote. And one person that sticks in my mind during that movement when it comes to voting is C.T. Vivian, who stood on the courthouse 
face to face with a sheriff demanding that they be let in to vote, which the sheriff refused and eventually knocked C.T. Vivian across his nose, broke his nose, nose bleeding, everything. C.T. Vivian hit the ground and bounced right back up and said, you, you may knock me down, but I'm gonna stand up every time for justice. And I don't, I don't see it nowadays. I don't see that same fight. I don't see that same passion. I don't think we realize how much we are affected by politics in our day-to-day -day life. Every day, um, your children were sent back to school during the pandemic. Let me say that again. Your children were sent back to school during a pandemic where parents were forced to make life decisions. Number one, do I send my child to school? Do I let them do the virtual learning? And if they do the virtual learning, who's going to watch them? Who's going to take care of them? So in that, there you go. That's who's representing you. That's who's standing for you. We got, um, redistricting coming up. That'll be, that'll happen this year. And that's done on a state level. So if you look at districts like District B, District B covers Acres Home, Greens Point, Portersville area, up in there, the Northeast side, Trinity Garden, Cashmere Garden, Fifth Ward, all of that on the Northeast side over there. That's District B. So, why is it split the way that it's split? Take a look at the map. Acres Home could be connected to the communities that are close to it. There are both underserved areas over there, low income areas, but then you have thriving areas, but then that's where the line is drawn. So why did, and I'm just looking at it, and I feel someone decided to take all of the disenfranchised communities and group them together, even though they're spread from the northeast side of Houston to the northwest side of Houston. But if you look at the neighboring districts, Kingwood, that district, which I believe is like District K or something like that, that borders the northeast side and all of that. Why aren't you grouped in with that? Why isn't Fifth Ward grouped in with the districts downtown? Hmm. I'm starting to see one common thing in those communities that District B communities border, but they're not a part of money. Money, money, money. So if you can find a way to group all the disenfranchised communities together, you throw elected officials in office that continue to tell you that, oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. When the money is there, they're just refusing to give it to you. This money in District B. Has District B seen the money? No. No, that's another issue that we're having. District B decided that they didn't want Jerry Davis in office. Jerry Davis is still in office due to a technicality with the election. Cynthia Bailey has a felony on her record. The question came up, can a felony hold office? Can they take seat? Now, this wasn't the first time that this issue came up in the state of Texas. And if it's not the first time that it came up, why is it still an issue to the point where it uh, is holding a seat vacant? nine months now. District B, a district that has a population of over 200,000 residents, is not being represented right now. Call down to District B and try to get them to do something for your community. 
try to don't let them tell you what they're already doing and hey you can come here tell them no this is what i want to see you do in this particular area and get back to me and let me know how that goes um we got to vote, man. We got to take control, take the reins. Another example I give people, family reunions. We all know about family reunions. Um, we've seen them on TV, we attended them or whatever. So let me tell you how the family reunion come about. People in the family, they get together and say, hey, we need to get together, y'all. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Every family donate. So let's just... For instance, the example, every family donate $1,000, right? You might have a family of four, but you donate $1,000 to help out with this family reunion and make it be nice and memorable, you know? So every family give $1,000. You have to figure out how to get there on your own. Um, once you get there, room and board, food and everything is taken care of. So when you get there, you get to the hotel room. Now, mind you, the family reunion is only like a two-day event, so you only need two nights, right? You get there to the hotel. It's a $30-night hotel. Okay. So you get to the venue. You get to the events. Uh, actually, there is no venue. A section off some tables at a park. It's a nice park. But they section off some tables at a park. Um, you know, not too much to do out there <laughs> unless you brought some games and things like that to do. Um, then you sit down to eat. When you sit down to eat, you have hamburgers, you have hot dogs, served on plastic plates, plastic utensils. It may or may not be napkins. So I know me, I was questioning what happened to my thousand dollars at the hotel room. But if you're not questioning it by the time you get to the venue and you see the food and you're like, okay, I'm not trying to be the one, but each family paid a thousand dollars and I'm not seeing a thousand dollars per family event going on out of here. That family reunion may end in the Civil War. Uh, this is my thoughts, my takes. I know I'll be pissed, I would be upset, and I won't know where my money at. Uh, this was for us to enjoy one another, which you can do, but we could have did that without paying $1,000, right? So this is exactly what's going on in your city, in your state, in your country when you don't partake in this system. Then if you don't partake, if you don't vote, then you you can't question the room, the food, the venue, none of it. But if you do vote, then you have every right to raise hell and allow your voice to be heard. And then if enough of you yell and make enough noise, then I'm pretty sure the culprits are gonna to wanna to try to resolve the issue some type of way. That's politics in a nutshell. The family reunion is the issues that we face in our community as a family. We have to come together to let our elected officials know, which are the family members, that decided to put this thing together and be in control of this thing and make sure everything went smoothly, went the right way, that everything that they said was going to be done is done. We have to hold those people accountable and we have to question what's going on with our money. Why is it that Rice Village can look the way that it looks? Why is it that Maryland can look the way that it looks? Why is it that Kingwood can look the way that it looks? You know, all these so-called prominent areas within Houston, we pay taxes just like them. Why can't our communities look like that? 
why don't we have resources in our community to empower the people in our community? In our community, our young boys, they think that the only way out is sports, music, or drugs. Why aren't we putting resources in our community to expose these young men to different opportunities in life? That's what Mangrove is about. That's what we do here. You should see the faces light up when we do introduce these cats to new things. We show some young men how to make shirts to the They blowing my phone up. They want to make more shirts because they see I got a tool where I can actually do something today and make some money tomorrow and I'm not hurting nobody. We showed these young men 3D printers. We showed these men drones and what jobs are out there with drones. These, these young men are very, very intrigued with this. These are not the things that our elected officials see important for our community. I guess they think bike trails are important over the people first, which don't get me wrong, I'm all for beautification, but a bike trail versus a center teach job skills, job training. Job training wins every day. Um, so I'm just giving y'all the real. Man. That's why I'm here, to give you the real, let you know why it's important to vote, to let you know that mangrove community, we're in the thick of it. Um, we're out getting people registered. So please stay tuned. Stay locked in so you can stay informed. It's important, you all. This is a very, very important election year. Um, I believe that change can be made. I'm going to leave you all with this. God established government. So, Government is not bad. We just got some bad players right now. It's time for some new draft picks. We need some Deshaun Watsons of the world who not only play a good game on the field, but off the field and in his community. We need people like that in office. And I know we got people sitting like that right in our communities. So educate yourself on what it takes to lead and represent your community. And if you feel like you're the man or the woman for the job, go for it. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Again, please follow us, hit the like button. Uh, go ahead and pick up your I vote shirts to keep the movement going. You can get those on the website www.mangrovecommunity.org. We'll be here if you have any questions. If you would like to get involved, you would like to volunteer, please reach out to us, please contact us. Um, I want to thank Boost for, for the support. We'll be um, coming to Plush Bar and Grill pretty soon. Just had a conversation with them. So we thank you all. We thank you. We thank you. Y'all have a blessed night. And again, like I always tell you, that thing that's burning inside, that thing you want to do, that's your passion. Step out on your passion. Take a step towards your passion today. And be a positive change for yourself and those around you. Peace and blessings, y'all. Y'all have a good one. Thank you for tuning in.